at the time I, I told people that this is not a machine intended to replace drummers, it's just another tool for the drum set. I mean, there's so many wonderful drummers and this, these machines can never listen to the music and respond to the dynamics and to the rubato timing and to thinking of ideas and, and the guitarist or the pianist plays something beautiful and leads the music in a certain direction, the drummer will listen, he'll play something else. Now, that's not always the case in overdub music, but mm -hmm. that, was, that was always the magic I found in great drummers and I was just trying to create the best approximation that I could. Howdy, Ronaldites and Russelloids. It's your friendly neighborhood podcast host, Christian Huey, back with another episode of All You Ever Think About Is Sparks, still the only All Sparks podcast out there that I'm aware of. Not much to report today in Sparks World for today's episode, our 45th, although the brothers did let slip in a recent interview that they are working on a new album to follow up 2023's The Girl Is Crying In Her Latte. And I'm afraid that's all that they revealed. However, we don't have even rumors or innuendo to keep us happy yet. I'll say more in this space as details roll in. A uh, But first, quick, what do all these hit songs have in common? Caribbean Queen by Billy Ocean, Ebony and Ivory, it's Paul McCartney and uh, Stevie Wonder, Shock the Monkey, Peter Gabriel, When Doves Cry by Prince, Take On Me by Aha, The Boys of Summer by Don Henley, Relax by Frankie Goes to Hollywood, Radio Gaga by Queen, Don't You Want Me by The Human League, and Dress You Up by Madonna. If you guessed that they were all featured on a John Hughes film soundtrack, I'm afraid the answer is no, but you're not too far off. For the record, every one of those songs, besides being massive top 40 hits in multiple countries, every one of them uses the same instrument for its drum track, either in part or in whole. You've been listening to the unmistakable sound of the Lin drum, the first digital drum machine and the first rhythm box to actually put the fear of God in the hearts of human drummers. That's because it was the first drum machine that could actually sound like a real drummer playing real drums. You see, instead of relying on analog synthesis to create drum sounds from the ground up, the Lindrum stored high bitrate for the time, digital samples of real percussion instruments. The Lindrum was the brainchild of one Mr. Roger Lynn, a then fairly unknown musician and songwriter out of California. Roger was doing fairly well as a songwriter throughout the latter half of the 70s, penning hits for heavyweights like Eric Clapton and Leon Russell, and frequently accompanying these acts on tour as a guitarist. But when Roger was rehearsing alone, and especially when he was recording demos, a nagging problem kept creeping up. He needed a drum track, but there wasn't always a drummer around, nor a kit available to bang upon. He wanted to have realistic drum parts for his songwriting demos, and there was nothing that sounded like a real drummer back then. Plus, he was on the road with Leon Russell, and he wanted to be able to work on songs in his hotel room. Heeding the advice of Steve Porcaro of the band Toto, Lynn decided he should look at using real samples in a drum machine. In 1979, he began work on what would be named the Lynn LM-1 drum computer. To capture the samples that he needed, Roger Lynn crammed drummer Art Wood into a large closet to help with damping and had him hit a kick. Snare, toms, ride, crash, rimshot, cowbell, etc. While he recorded the drum hits on relatively basic equipment. The resulting samples were stored on EPROM, EP -ROM, and with some clever electronics and musical know-how, the LM-1 was born. The LM-1 was released in 1980, and it carried a hefty price tag of $5,500, which, to put it into context, would be a little over $12,000 in 2024 U.S. dollars. 
This meant that only well-established studios with deep pockets could afford one, locking out most upstart or independent acts of the day. The LM-1 was a beast of a machine. Not only would it play and store real drum sounds, but it also had a rudimentary step sequencer for programming patterns and chains of patterns. It came with the then novel quantize feature, which would force wayward beats to conform precisely to the desired rhythm and tempo. You could also use the new swing function to alter the timing of a particular beat in a sequence to give the pattern a, uh, a swingier or jazzier sound. Despite all of these breakthroughs, the first Lindrum model suffered from one major limitation. It had no cymbal sounds, as cymbals required a longer sample recording. Longer sample recordings meant larger files, and data storage was still awfully expensive in 1980. Demand for the LM-1 was sky-high, despite the sky-high price, and despite, or maybe even because of, the fact that only 525 were manufactured in total. Early adopters of LM-1 included Stevie Wonder, Peter Gabriel, Fleetwood Mac, Michael Jackson, and a surprising number of newcomers like Gary Newman, The Human League, Prince, and Devo. As game-changing as the LM-1 was, Roger Lynn was aware of the device's limitations, cost included. After releasing two updates to the LM-1, Lynn developed its legendary follow-up, the LM-2 in 1982. The LM-2 was the first of Lin's creations to be branded as simply the Lin Drum. In most contexts, when someone mentions the Lin Drum, they're most likely referring to the LM-2. The LM-2 boasted higher quality samples, a bigger library of samples, including symbols, a more robust built-in sequencer, and a more stable internal clock to prevent stored patterns from falling out of sync. And it could be had for the lower cost of $3,000 or about $9,800 in today's money. The sounds that came out of the Lindrum snare, hand clap, tambourine, ride, cymbal, cymbal, crash, high tom, low tom, medium tom, etc. could all be mistaken for the real deal to untrained ears. In retrospect, the Lindrum samples tend to sound drier, uh, punchier, with quicker attacks and shorter decays than their real instrument counterparts tend to sound. Without being obtrusive in their artificiality, the Lindrum's trademarks, more staccato, more precision, faster and harder attacks, all that quickly came to define the sound of a new digital era in pop music. And this was all even before the MIDI revolution, which ushered music into even deeper digital realms. Sparks were no strangers to new musical tech by the time of the sessions for 1983's In Outer Space. They had used drum machines before, but the gear had always either sounded too fake for Ron and Russell's tastes, or uh, it wouldn't allow the level of flexibility and control that they sought, or both. The Lindrum hit the sweet spot for Sparks, and the instrument dominates that record in outer space. It's steady as a rock beats, not to be confused with rock steady beats, are perfectly suited to dance music. And this is likely a major contributing factor to In Outer Space being Sparks' most electronic, dancey sounding album since 1979's Italo Disco Monster, number one in heaven. Tracks like the high energy single All You Ever Think About Is Sex benefit the most from the exacting, brutally precise sound of the Lindrum. More traditional sounding rock numbers, however, like Praying for a Party, to these ears sound too rigid, nearly to the point of bloodlessness, to meet many listeners' needs from that genre. The Bates Motel, aka Gleaming Spires, return on an outer space for a third time as Sparks' backup band. They're even pictured on the back cover of the album. So, it's curious that Sparks would choose to lean so heavily on synthetic production and synthetic sounds 
so as to render those players' contributions almost inaudible at times, especially drummer David Kendrick. To be fair, the Spires added a much-needed muscularity to the new songs once Sparks took them on the road. So, it's very possible Sparks was keeping them on the payroll to have a proven touring band at the ready even as Sparks' sound drifted further and further away from a four-piece rock setup and toward computer-assisted dance music, the members of the Gleaming Spires continued to show up in Sparks' album credits, all the way until 1988, when Sparks at last sought to record an album all by themselves in their brand new home studio. After the wildly successful LM2, a.k.a. Lindrum, Roger Lynn didn't rest on his laurels. He continued to innovate, for example, with the MPC-60 MIDI Production Center. That was a sampling drum machine with a MIDI sequencer, Sympty Sync, and other cutting-edge features. The product of a partnership with Akai, the MPC-60, was released in 1988 and is championed today for having revolutionized the hip-hop genre. Lynn is still active in the world of electronic music gear today, having recently released a new kind of MIDI controller called the Linstrument. Like a piano keyboard, the Linstrument is polyphonic and can be played with both hands on keys, although the look and the arrangement of these keys is vastly different than on a keyboard. They're arranged in a grid of touch-sensitive, square-shaped buttons. From the same interface, the user can play notes either in real time or programmed as part of a sequence. The most impressive feature of the instrument is the so-called expressive swing arpeggiator. According to Lin's official website, the arpeggiator, quote, responds to all dimensions of movement for entirely new ways of beat synced play. The replay all mode creates chordal rhythms merely by varying chord pressure and gives finger drummers entirely new ways to perform beats live. I'd like to get my hands on one of those. Thanks so much for listening, Sparks fans. Now I'm passing the mic over to me and Monty Mallon as we bring you part two of our discussion of Sparks in Outer Space. Dance, god damn it. So song two, uh, we've got something else in a similar vein, popularity. Yeah. I think most Sparks fan I I like this song. I I like this song. Uh, I think this might be one on this album where people do see a little bit more depth, a little bit more irony, as you put it. Right. Uh, you know, that which, yeah. and that irony, by the way, is kind of ironic because the the lyrics As are irony predicted. often yeah. is exactly. Yeah. I, the irony has a damn uh, habit of being ironic uh, because the the lyrics are presented in a really straightforward way. And I really do think that Ron was sincere in in portraying the point of view of you know whatever this narrator whoever this narrator is i Um, remember reading way back when ron saying he wasn't trying to write it as if it was a great uh composition he was trying to write it the way people talked and he wanted that to really be conveyed but But it comes across that way and it does and 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 these and this is the kind of point that ron keeps making publicly around the uh release and promotion of this record when he is there's no rhymes no rhymes no rhymes. you said yeah it's just a conversation i like you and you like me a lot and it's nice to be all alone with you too you know it it doesn't yeah it doesn't follow the typical song structure right so here it is I, i i found exactly what what ron uh was saying around that time Uh, I want to write as people talk, but some audiences are used to hearing things in a song kind of way, phrased with language that's specifically for songs. It's a a catch-22. Popularity, I think, is very successful in capturing speech, doing away with convention, except maybe an occasional rhyme. 
especially on that song. It might seem poorly written to radio programmers. I don't know. That sort of thing is, it excites me. I want to strip away everything poetic, everything that, that sounded like lyrics. It's kind of too easy to understand, and people will be suspicious because it's too simple. Those were Ron's words in 1983. Well, boy, I have a lot of thoughts when you when you say that. The quote I had heard or remember reading was simpler along the lines of what I said. And your comment is, is much – hearing those comments is much, much better and more revealing. Uh, you know, two, two thoughts that come to my mind. One is it's great for Ron that he has a singer of the caliber of his brother – to kind of really be able to put across whatever Ron wants to put across. Right. And in this song, he's just so casual in his singing that it works. It's so, it's, right. they're so on the same wavelengths that you, you get that here. He's singing it exactly how Ron, at least from my, to my ears, exactly how Ron must have wanted it, you know, just kind of like talking. Well, almost. I think that's also, you know, where we have to, give uh russell some credit for his own genius is that he could have he could have sung this in a in a in a you know ridiculous way he could have he could have sung this yeah. in an ironic way he could have sung this in a way where we didn't believe him as yeah. he's presenting this character but but he did you know yeah, yeah. and it, it's believable and i think that kind of gets to what ron wanted which uh, was to present this point of view in an honest way. Although deep down, I still believe, you know, that Ron probably thought that this was probably a superficial way of seeing the world, but he still has some, some sympathy for this character, the narrator. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think it's, it comes across Russell is, is magnificent on a lot of, uh, well, all the album, but on this song, um, I can't wait till we talk about Dance, God Damn It, my favorite song on the album. Oh, it's going to be a while. Yeah, it will be <laughs> this, at our pace. It will be. <laughs> but I mean, you know, Get back to me in two years. Yeah, Russell is great. Yeah, uh, uh, Sparks in Outer Space, part 11. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. you know, the, the other thing is it really speaks to Ron as a songwriter when he almost doesn't want to be a songwriter. Yeah. It comes across yeah. so well. Yeah, yeah. It just comes across, you know, it's almost he can't help being brilliant in a way. Yeah. And boy, yeah. am I biased, no doubt. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know, but but it's true in my mind. It really is. He can pull that off. It's a nice song. And I've always, this one has always been a favorite. But I think it's a favorite of most people who love the, who listen to this album. Yeah. It's always a relief uh, to hear a song um, that is so without layers. Layers, right? Thank you. <laughs> right, thank you. Right. <laughs> it's without right. guile, uh, without trying to figure things out. Like, it's just straight out there. Like, this is what this person is saying. And, and, and it clicks. And, 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 it's, and it's a brave thing um, in a lot of ways. Now for what they wanted to do at this point in their career, that was the way to go. With all of these songs on the on the first side of this album, by the way, I, I wanted to, like, kind of pick them apart and try to, try to figure out musically you know what what makes them work and this was another example where it's in c major which is like the most basic key and he sticks with c for almost all of it and the only time he ever ventures away from c is when he goes to a minor you know which is very closely related to c so there's just not a whole lot of movement musically uh, going on here yeah. and yet it works and it works. and i think that yeah. steadiness and that not wanting to venture too far away from things sonically kind of works in tandem with where the song wants to go lyrically which is like we're not going anywhere <laughs> yeah, this is no, the no, point we're making we're just like the song yeah yeah exactly um, <laughs> <laughs> We're just talking. Um, I'm with you on that one. And it's it's a great song and it's really a testament to what they can do when they say, you know, they always change styles. And when yeah. they say the style we want is simple and straightforward and not complicated and not a lot of layers, they can come up with this. Yeah. Yeah. Also, you know, like I, I don't know if I've really talked about this enough, but 
um, as simple as the arrangement is, that beat is so good and driving. And it sounds like it sounds like it might be sort of a throwback to the sort of motorique beat that like was being done by Kraftwerk or or, or Can or, or things like that in in the in the mid seventies. I tried to isolate the beat. I listened to it. It was a pa 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 which is just like the motorique beat, which gives you a sense of progressing along without a lot of tension. Popularity. I like you, and you like me a lot, and we do those things that can make us feel hot. Find some friends, all of them are all right, and we talk for a while, then we climb in our cars. What a night. We all drive into town, where we'll park our cars and meet the rest of our friends. At a place that's called, I forget what it's called, but it's really great, and our friends will all be there. Popularity. It's, like, it's not only how people talk, it's about how really, <laughs> really right. stoned people talk. <laughs> that's very true. But I know. I feel great, but it's getting real late. So I'll drive you home now, and you'll slide up real close. I'm so glad we met, and I like you so much. And I'm also glad that I got all those friends. Popularity, popularity. One of the more successful songs on the album in terms of what they were trying to do in that regard. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a good song. It makes my lists. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And unlike you know, the and next it, one. Unlike every, the next one. Yeah. Oh, do you? All right. Well, here no, we go. Unlike, unlike the next one. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, song number three is Praying for a Party. All right, what do you think? This one never resonated with me. me I mean either. It's it's every now and then it just seemed a little beneath them, you know. This it is was, where it, maybe not that, but maybe it just didn't seem credible. Like popularity, yeah. simple lyrics, but it was credible in, in the context of what we just talked about for the last hour. <laughs> However, you want to hear my my it. my right. sort of pseudo theory about this? Yeah, is that th this is told from the same perspective as uh, one of those. Uh, frustrated uh suburban uh adolescent characters that were in uh all over the the big beat album who just wants to go to a party mom and dad a rock party like he wants to go see kiss or something and this is sort of his lament this song it's presented like it wants to be that sort of kiss style rock song with the you know the big chords yeah. of course it comes off very sterile and I don't know if that's by intent. I'd, I'd like to think that some of it was by intent because it is pretty fucking sterile. Well, to me, it just sounds like a song that was also written to get airplay, even though I don't think Do it think? was ever released as a single. But it was like, I think they wanted an anthem, you know, okay. that everybody, you know, like you said, a kiss anthem or something. Right. That everybody would sing. And it just, 
it was too far afield because it didn't have that those that nuance that uh popularity has it doesn't work for me i'm sure others like it it doesn't work for me a gesture at being a rock song without it being a rock song truly like it's there are pantomimes of it being a rock song you've got these weird stabs of uh these guitar chords which you know may have been done by bob hogg i i assume i don't know if bob hogg ever even played it live i'm not sure yeah i don't recall seeing it on set list but it could be it could have been yeah i mean it's so very basic you know that kiss anthem type song right just it's just too much it strayed too far from them in my opinion it could be it could Plus be it wasn't a very good song it's not a, it's not a, it, well it's not a great song but the way they present the rockness of it sounds yeah. so synthetic to me that i want to believe that it was on purpose and i don't know and that's kind of one of my biggest um sticking points with this entire album is mm-hmm. i don't know how much of what seems ironic was ironic or was it sincerity slash possible laziness well we'll have a fun discussion on rocking girls on that one. Oh my gosh yes we will because that's not very rocking saturday night and time that i go to bed daddy good night and mama good night it's 10 don't forget son to pray nice anything dad you say i'm gonna pray till both of my knees are red praying for a party come on come on lord Lord. praying for a party and then all of my friends are praying like praying fools send us a little jive we'll be all right what do we have to do what do we have to do what do we have to do lord to get on through i just can't wait no more i'm running out that door God helps those who helps themselves to a real good time. So do you think Ron spent 15 minutes, 20 minutes on that, on those lyrics? Yes, I, I think he spent yeah. 15 or yeah. 20 minutes on those yeah. lyrics. I don't know if I said this before, but uh, um, there, there was a quote where uh, Ron had whipped out the uh, what ended up being the final uh, lyrics to popularity in about 20 minutes. Uh, I believe <clears throat> it. So this could be another example yeah. of that. Yeah, who knows if that's true or not. Let's talk about the song that you think is magnificent. All right, let's get to it, huh? All you ever think about is sex. Here we are. Yeah. Kind of the the namesake for this whole show I've been doing for almost five years now. There you go. All right. Meant to be. This is an interesting song to me in a number of ways. Uh, First of all, um, the, the form of the song. This is the first song that Sparks had ever done in uh, the high energy sort of su- subgenre of music, which was just coming about around this time, around 1983. And um, high energy is kind of a form of sort of post uh, disco with uh, you got a fast tempo, 
120, uh, 20 to about 140 beat, beats per minute. You've got the octave bass lines, like you hear in a lot of disco stuff. Bum, 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 right? You get the synthetic drums. You've got a lot of staccato hi-hats, a lot of 16th notes, tick, 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 very little swing, very little funk. This particular subgenre of music had really taken hold around this time in gay discos in uh, the U.S. and, and uh, presumably uh, Western Europe which was uh, interesting for me. I mean, they had already sort of dabbled in um, an earlier, you know, in, in, in disco through uh, Giorgio Moroder. And Donna Summers, this is where the term came from. Donna Summers frequently referred to I Feel Love as being a high energy dance track, oh. which had many of those same elements. And that's where that, that term came from. So around this time, uh, you had a lot of songs that had these same elements. You had Frankie goes to Hollywood with relax. And I promise you, if you listen to those two songs, at least the first minute side by side, there's a lot of similarities. I, I find it doubtful that Sparks uh, wasn't aware of high energy music at that time and weren't striving to emulate it in some way or at least weren't inspired by it in some way it was a type of music that was storming the the clubs at that time but what was interesting about it was that it was uniquely a a gay club i'm not trying to make any sort of you know connections in that regard i have to believe that they 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 knew that that was the type of music that was big in that community at that time and they leaned into it and probably to get you know, more play in clubs and to get more exposure. Well, you know, have, have you ever heard the, um, what's it called? The extended mix of it? Yeah. It completely validates what you're saying. I think this one is, it captures that and it, uh, you know, and it definitely captures that. And I would have no reason at all to think that they weren't familiar with that music, but I also think it's a really strong spark song. Well, um, I agree. Yeah. But if you listen to the extended mix, you've almost described it to a T. It doesn't really have that many sparks elements, but it has all the other elements that you just talked about. I had some notes here from a uh, book uh, that was uh, released and uh, published in 2000. Modulations, a history of electronic music. High energy was reliant on technology and was all about unfeasibly athletic dancing bionic sex and superhuman stamina and doesn't that describe the song lyrically the freedom associated with it seemed to be embodied by a literal escape from human embodiment and synchrony with technology okay i can hear all that but let me say can are, do, is there more that you want to say on this or not really i'm not like right, trying so to make a final point I am going to say something that I think you'll be very happy to hear. I think this song captures how good this album is at its strongest points. Agreed. This is, if you had a whole album this good, it would be a Sparks classic. Yeah. That's how much yeah. I think of this song. And to me, I hear what you're saying, but I also hear it as very classic Sparks. I think the words are really good. Um, I love the way there's that one part where they go, in a world of lovers, we don't love each other much. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Fact is, we're too busy to love each other much. That's a classic Sparks device where you change the well, feel of the song a little it's bit. It's an inversion of yeah. the emotional quality of what you know has been building up. I, I think this is a song, this is a great song. I, the words are funny there there is some irony there um but it's also really just funny you know when your father came home he saw us and dropped dead <laughs> you know it's, funny. it's just funny. a funny song but it's also a really good spark song and it mm -hmm. has that little twist at the end there which is yeah. classic sparks which they do all the way to today um you know they do it all over the place uh and i think that had they 
worked a little harder in a couple places, this could have been one of the classic Sparks albums, in my opinion. They got every note right on this one, I think. And it was also just like, it was just really cool to see, because they hadn't done this, I think, since at, at, at least when I'm with you, uh, to try to sneak something into the dance clubs. Mm -hmm. something that they think could just be, you know, put, you know, place in, in, in the mix when people are dancing and they'll just get and just sort of, uh, you know, dissolve into it. It sounds so much like, and by the way, like before we got together and, and recorded this, I went back and I, I listened to a whole bunch of other high energy, um, uh, songs that came out around this time, 1982, 83, 84, 85. And so many of them have a lot of uh, similar qualities. Uh, they've, you know, they're in a minor key. Um, they've got a bunch of sixteenth notes uh, with the bass and with the hi hat and and all this stuff. And they've got the floor and the floor and and all this sort of. Well, it's just right on the money. It's like they took that structure and they just got everything right. And how amazing would it be, sort of? toward what you were saying if they had done this for the for the whole album yeah but i hear it also i i hear that quality but i also hear uh a different quality to it yeah um, you know because the songs some of the songs you mentioned just do not have words that are this this funny every single line in here is humorous whether it's at the beginning where they're just drawing these kind of funny puns, sharing, stating our positions on the White House lawn, right. or when they're talking about the Dodgers and the Mets. It's a very funny song, but it also is kind of a, a an electronic rocker more in my mind. Anyway, great song. I love this song. I learned to play all the songs on the first side of this album on my guitar when I was studying all this stuff because I wanted to know how this stuff broke down. All you ever think about is sex. All you ever think about is sex. Think about the places. We've had our little fun in the church at Christmas, busted by that nun. Then in that museum, beneath the mastodon, stating our positions on the White House lawn. Sorry, it's one of the best Ron jokes. That's really great. Absolutely. Um yeah. All you ever think about is sex. All you ever think about exclusively. All you ever think about is sex. All right with me. Say, do you remember the Dodgers and the Mets? 50,000 people saw us and turned red. I'm still not recovered from Saturday's faux pas when your father came home, saw us, and dropped dead. All you ever think about is sex. All you ever think about exclusively. All you ever think about is sex. All right with me. All you ever think about is sex. All you ever think about exclusively. All you ever think about is sex. All right with me. In a world of lovers, we don't love each other much. Fact is, we're too busy to love each other much. And that really great little bridge. Yeah. All you ever think about is sex. All you ever think about exclusively. All you ever think about is sex. All right with me. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Thank you. 
there it is. Yeah, it's a good song. Yeah. The, I really appreciate that the chorus is also very simple and uh, uh, unfussy in a way that you would not expect for a pop song to be. All you ever think about is sex. Is sex. All you ever think about. Exclusively. There's not... He's not playing a lot of word games in, in that chorus. Uh, he's sort of doing the same thing where he's trying to state things as they really are. Right. And and it and it just uh, works. There's not a lot of word games on this album compared to something. No, there aren't. No. Yeah. He was going for something a little different. Here's a little tidbit for you. Let's see. Um we were once invited, this is from Russell. We were once invited to perform a special year-end concert at Disneyland. This song had been a radio hit in Los Angeles. However, the Disney officials requested that in keeping with the squeaky clean image of their park, and since apparently none of the Disney characters ever have sex, we did not perform this song. Our fans were not happy. <laughs> so, Disney... Got their hooks in, in Sparks, which is also in a whole other little side story. We should get into at some point. Um, but they would not let them play that song uh, right. when they play it at Disneyland. They have a little history with Disney, though. So, and, Yeah, I've, I've got a lot of questions about that. I mean, especially after that song on Angst, you know, yeah. the Mickey Mouse song. Yeah, And of course, uh, we won't get into it now, but we'll get into it either in the next episode or maybe one after that, uh, that Disney tapped Sparks to record a song for, yeah, to do the Minnie Mouse song yeah, <laughs> for the uh, Mickey Mouse uh, Splash Dance uh, album. Yeah. Crazy. Shall we round out side one? Let's do it. Please, baby, please. All right. This is the second uh, and final song of the the first side uh, where they're favoring a minor key again. This is uh, a little more, um, I'm not sure what the word is for it, but you know, it's more, more, more downbeat. <clears throat> Do you have any thoughts about Please Baby Please? Well, at the beginning of our conversation, when I said, this is an album that has a number of good songs, but not outstanding songs. And right. but there is nothing wrong with the songs. There's nothing wrong with the album per se. You know, this is exactly one of the ones that I I think of in that category. Nothing yeah. wrong with the song. To me, not very distinctive or interesting. To be honest, right. um, it's okay, but you know. It doesn't sound like something that's uniquely sparks. It doesn't sound like anything that's particularly interesting to me. Um, again, sometimes the writing is a little, uh, you know, a little inconsistent on this album. And I think on this one, maybe not quite up to the same par as what you'd expect from Ron at times. I'm trying yeah. to, you know, yeah. there's nothing wrong with it, but it just doesn't, it's never really stood out to me as one of the, as, as a particularly interesting or great song. Yeah, um, I'm with you. You know, you know, as I said, you know, Ron like took pains in interviews around this time to say that he was really trying to be earnest and genuine with the lyrics. And I can absolutely see why he could be honoring that with a song like this. Yeah. But on the other hand, it does seem kind of lazy. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's okay, but you know, you start to have certain expectations when you listen to a band for uh, you know fifteen years or however long it was at that point. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. when you hear something like this, in my mind, it's just mm, that's all right. Doesn't you realize like we're going to be inundated with all kinds of like emails and stuff saying you guys don't understand the brilliance of please baby please. What's wrong? And that's wonderful. You? Yeah, I have to agree, man. I'm I'm sorry. I, I mean, I, I wish I could say, you know, as I was kind of saying before, I don't particularly, I, I don't particularly want to spend a whole lot of time thinking about it. Like with with I, 
all you ever think about is sex. Over the years, I've thought about that one. I've like always enjoyed listening to it because it always grabbed me and it was always fun to listen to. And there's yeah. always some some nuance to it. And it was so well constructed, you know? It is well constructed. This one was just, meh, it's there. All right. I, I would love to read this. G-sharp minor. Blang. <laughs> I don't know why you treat me this way. I'm a sensitive guy and I'm really in pain, but you're cool to the point of saying no dice. Well, I'll never accept it. Never accept it. Just think it over tonight. Just think it over for one more night. Oh, please, baby, please. Can't you treat me better? Please, baby, please. Can't you treat me better? I've been making a fool of myself as the corniest guy in all of L.A., sending flowers and candy, the things I detest, but I got to impress you, got to impress you. All the things that I've tried, all of the things that I once despised. Oh, that's what it says. There's a little O there. Uh, (laughs) No one's worth all the stuff I go through. Only you, only you, only you, only you. You know, speaky the language when I get near and I'm losing it fast. I'm getting weird. Etc. You know, it's really designed for an L.A. audience. A lot of this album yeah. is designed for the fans in L.A. So, who right. love them. And this one is for their L.A. fans, and they probably just, they probably love it. For Not yeah. all. I don't, want, I don't want to overgeneralize, but I'm sure it made sense to them. It was a fun spark song. Yeah. 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 That's, that's, that's pretty generous, I think. Yeah. You know, and uh, yeah, and. Uh, the way we've sort of reviewed the first half of uh, the album is kind of how I feel like we're going to, you know, fall in the second half, uh, maybe even slightly less. Uh, well, that'll be a fun then. discussion then, because I like the second album, second oh, side. Okay. More than the first in some ways. That's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to see if there's anything else important we should talk about um, that happened, like, as this album came out. Well, first of all, I know we didn't talk about either of the, the videos and there were two videos that were released and they were both from songs from the the first side. One was cool places. And of course, you know, the other one was all you ever think about is sex. Um, you know, I, it's been a couple of days, but before that several years before I, uh, had last seen the video for cool places have you watched that video recently sure yeah do you have thoughts about that you want to share well we talked about that with the cool places video oh it was, that's right it was for mtv yeah it was mtv okay it was fun you know yeah but yeah all the green screen stuff yeah um or uh okay so how about uh, all you ever think about is sex I that can't was a lot that. simpler yeah i don't recall that video i'm gonna i'll watch it for next time i promise yeah. All right. No worries. Uh, yeah. Look it up. Google it. There's not a lot going on. There are many cream pies. Uh, oh, for... right, 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 right. Throwing right. it, Ron. 
Right, 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 right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, the whole pie throwing at Ron thing, like I said earlier, it just kind of bugs me. I don't know. It, it doesn't <laughs> sit right with me. And that video, I can't, I almost can't watch it. It seems like he's such an icon. Yeah. Well, why would you want to throw a pie at this guy? <laughs> well, you know, I guess you could say maybe, you know, at, in 1983, not everybody knew that. Or cared, I, I, they did. He, they did though. He, I don't like it. I, I think it's yeah. just not not. It's beneath them in some ways. It's yeah. beneath Ron, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's not showing proper respect for him and what he's done. To be honest, That's well, what I it, so yeah. it it was probably in line with this sort of thing they were trying to do off and on, which is make them into a comedy duo like Laurel and Hardy, and. Yeah. And you know, and here and here's Ron being the fall guy, you know, yeah. But whatever. Yeah, I get you. It lasted one more album and it was probably taken to its most extreme on pulling rabbits. Yeah. And then they pulled back from that, which to their which is to their credit. Sure, uh, you know? sure. And yeah, they, they pulled back from that. And I'm glad they pulled back from that. I, I don't think they would have lasted as long as as if that was who they wanted to be for the rest of their career. Yeah. They were if smart you, enough to see that that wasn't the best way to go. Yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm with you there. So, um, so you know, of course, we're only talking about the first half of this album <laughs> right now. We'll talk about the second half another time. Um, but were there things that you think that so far this album could have been made better than what we got? Well, yeah, uh, you know, and I think I kind of hinted at that with all you ever think about is sex. I think that's a template for a really great album that, that the album that this could have been. Yeah. Uh, that said, I think there's a lot of fun songs on this. Uh, you know, we're a fun bunch of guys. Dance Goddamn It is my one of my personal favorites on the yeah. album. I think there's a lot of good stuff. I think is just kind of a we got to you know let's put out a third album here in L.A. and this is what they came up with and it was different. I, I think the real story of the album and maybe we can talk about this next time a little bit more is what we started talking about a little bit, which is what you see in retrospect, which is that it put ideas in their head and it got them thinking about how they can do things a little bit differently. If uh -huh. they really work together, take control of their process, which the next album might have been John Ashdown will hate me for saying this, a misstep or maybe a step uh, in the wrong direction. We're but gonna get him pulled, on here. But yeah. I know, I know about that they, one. But then they pulled it back. Then they pulled yeah. it back with uh music that you can dance to, which is just a jumble. But I think that's the great thing about it. But we'll discuss that then. But yeah. then, you know, you could see they then they stepped back and retrenched for a few years and put in their own studio and 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 all the other things that happened. And is I that what this is? Is this a retrenchment? Is this a step forward? Is this a step back? What do you think this is? Neither. That's that's the key point, Christian. It's neither. Yeah. And they don't really stay in place. It's a little different, but I don't think it's a step forward. I don't think it's a step back. It's just what it is. Yeah. Um, it's a step back, I think, in overall quality compared to the last two. It's a step forward in terms of starting to inculcate them to a different way of thinking about how they can create their yeah. music. Yeah. So it has those qualities to it. And those are the important qualities, I think, in retrospect, I hear that I really, really like. Um, but the yeah. songs themselves only get to a certain point. Yep. No, and, I'm with you. Yeah. Yep. I think it took them a few years, actually, to get to the point where they really became sparks you know it really wasn't until uh gratuitous sex that they really re-established themselves and As started smart. that phase of their career i think that's probably when they really fully owned their brand uh yes. between the two of them yeah. yes so, they yeah. fully owned it yeah yep. and that that came that that uh came to fruition with little beethoven that was oh, the, absolutely the transition period yeah. of three albums that got them to little beethoven all right. It's so good to talk to you again, Monty. Good to talk to you too. Absolutely. Yeah, Thank you, Christian. Great talking. You, you got it, man. All right. All you ever think about is sad.